Um, greetings, everybody, and welcome to Dojo Talks. Today's episode, we talk professionalism in chess. I am David, one of the three senseis here in the chess dojo, and I am very happy. Um, I guess we've never been upset or angry to have a certain guest, but I'm very happy to have Grandmaster Noel Studer here as my guest. Noel, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right. So um, for everybody out there, you um, no shout out target set. All right. Let's reset it. I said it last night in advance. Um, no, no. I said it in follow because that's right. There we go. Because um, Noel does not stream on Twitch, um, unlike several of our other guests that we've had so far. But he does teach chess via this blog here. And I know the latest post in your blog says that you don't provide chess coaching like one-on-one, -on -one, but it's fair to say that you're teaching through your blog, right? Yeah, that's that's at least the goal of it. Let's let's put it that way. That's a goal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So um, the first thing that I'd like to do today is just ask Noel a few questions because his blog is quite. Um, different and original from the other chess content that I see out there right now. And I mean, even just the choice of medium, I see a lot of people streaming, a lot of people doing YouTube videos um, and not, not so much like blog. It's almost like blog is older than video stuff. So I'm very curious um, to talk to Noel a little bit about, you know, who he is and what he's trying to do. And then we'll get into today's topic. And I think It'll be linked for all of you. Um, and if somebody has a pressing question for Noel, you can also ask it in the chat and we may be able to incorporate it into the show quickly. But first of all, um, Noel, let me ask you, do you consider yourself a professional chess player? Yes, I do. Yep. Okay, that's a great start. And um, where are you at currently in your chess career? Like um, how far have you come along and where are you headed right now? Yeah, so I would split my chess career like in two phases. Um, so there was, uh, when I was young, you know, I started learning from my dad and then I played some tournaments. Didn't start too early, but uh, had the luck to um, to play the first European Championship with, uh, when I was 12. So that was, that was quite nice and it kept me playing. Um, but I've never really... Um, thought of being a professional chess player back then because everybody in Switzerland also says it's impossible. You cannot make any money with it and just don't do it. Go to study and be a CEO of some famous company and, and uh, get your paychecks and that's fine. Um, I knew that that's actually not what I wanted, but I didn't know back then that maybe chess professional could be something. And then in 2014, I was fifth at the World Championship under 18 and I played actually on the first board uh, playing for the gold medal um, in the last round. And that was when it sort of made click. Like, I stopped to have this Swiss mindset of I have absolutely no chance um, of competing internationally. And that's when I, you know, started to think about um, if I want to do this professionally. And one year later, 2015, I um, finished my high school degree. And um, as of then, I'm basically a chess professional. Um, nice. I've gotten the GM title um, in 2017. So when I was um, a bit more than 20, 20, 20 and half a year. Um, and I've won the Swiss championship twice. And now I'm rated 2581, if I'm not mistaken. So, mm -hmm. so that's a rough Yeah, 82, summary. but yeah, you've got one more point yeah? than you knew. So Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We found one extra rating point in your couch. Some Somebody gifted me this point? <laughs> I always thought I had 81, but okay. And sometimes they round it up or whatever, yeah? <laughs> okay, and um, that's great. I can see where you're coming from. It sounds like you're coming from a culture that um, that expects chess to be more amateur, and so it took you a moment to realize that actually for you, chess could be professional. Um, what what goals do you have now that you're a, a grandmaster on the cusp of 2600? Yeah, so um, one thing that 
is certainly uh, a goal is to be the highest ranked in Switzerland. Uh, we still have Milov um, that is higher ranked than me. He didn't play basically for the last six, seven years. Mm -hmm. But um, as we know in chess, you don't lose any rating if you don't play. So you just, you're right. just getting stuck. And I think right. he's around 2610 or something. So that's, that's uh, kind of close. But I, as um, I've discovered, you don't lose points not playing, but if you don't play for a long time and then finally you play, you can lose them really fast. That is true. But uh, there are some smart guys out there that just play games where they're pretty sure they, they can't lose too much or some leagues where they face 2200s or whatever. Yeah, so mm. You um, should get a Swiss CEO to sponsor a tournament for Mr. Milov, <laughs> who hasn't played in seven years. Give him an invitation, you know, not from... Not from Grandmaster Studer, but <laughs> yeah, no, but okay. I, mean, I, I hope you can, I can do it. I you can, can do, do it, it pretty soon, yeah? Yeah, you um, can do it with your own points. All right. Then, I mean, I've always been a competitive guy. So um, getting a medal at the European Championship, that's something um, I've always thought of um, being a nice achievement. And um, yeah, then there is my home tournament in Biel that's actually coming up in in one month. So that's basically a 30 minute train ride from where I grew up. So it's mm -hmm. really, really close. And um, winning this one would be, would be very nice. Cool. And I assume you mean the invitational section that often has Magnus Carlsen in it. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's, that's a great goal. It's interesting. Your goals um, seem to be more focused on like specific achievements and performances than on like a rating point or a standing in the world or something like that. Yeah. I've also frequently talked about, you know, top 100 or whatever, but, um, if I try to connect it to feelings, um, and that's always what I try to do when I set a goal, mm -hmm. like, yeah, if I say top 10 in the world, like, yeah, top 10, but that's like, you play a game in the Bundesliga or whatever, and maybe you enter that top 10, but I don't, get that emotional you know rush or whatever and right and so so it's more special for me to to win a tournament where right. you really have some strong emotion connected to it yeah so for you the point of being strong at chess is not just to be strong at chess but to be able to like take all that training go to a tournament and be really strong at that tournament absolutely yeah. i mean it's it, it has never been um the idea of like whatever earning well or or something like that. So just having 2750 and playing all the leagues and getting my paychecks is is not really what I what I would look for. So so I'm thinking more about the emotions that are connected to to achieving some some goal. Cool. Well, maybe we'll get into this more later. But I already noticed it's interesting. We're talking about being a professional. You consider yourself a professional, and you're not that focused on the paycheck, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I think, first of all, in Switzerland, there are so many easier ways to get uh, quite good paychecks. So um, I think the moment I started my chess, um, chess journey, uh, professional chess journey, I think I just, yeah, I, it wasn't, it wasn't as much on my mind and mm -hmm. I had to grind it out quite, quite a lot. So, um, I mean, I don't say that I don't want money, but but it's not the first thing I, I think about. And mm -hmm. I think, yeah, doing a study for five years and then working since, let's say, 2020 in, in a big company would have probably made me much more money than, than my choice as for now. So, yeah. so it, it's not the first thing I think about. Okay. And can you tell us about why you started this um, blog, Next Level Chess? Yeah, so um, it's actually pretty recently. So three months ago. Um, I think um, yeah, three months and three days ago, I started uh, with my first blog post. Um, and basically, playing professionally can be very, um, very private, very strange, because I have to keep my secret all for myself. Um, but I somehow didn't, didn't want to do that anymore. Like I, I always thought about sharing things, but at the end of the day, I thought about, well, what if people know what my secrets are and then they get stronger or people read how I prepare against them. So I've had always these, these thoughts in the back of my mind. And then at some point I just thought, okay, I'll just go for it and let's see what happens. I think it also helped that um, 
with with COVID, there are so few tournaments. So I was a bit less in the let's say rush uh, of playing tournaments or yeah thinking about okay what could my opponents know about myself. So yeah, that's uh, that's basically why I, I started. I wanted to share my knowledge and. Um, I'm very interested in the psychological part above all. Like I'm, as you probably saw, I don't do too many game analysis or, or whatever, not mm -hmm. too specific chess content, but um, habits or or things I, I worked with or whatever I had with my sports psychologist that helped me on a tournament, how to recover after losses. So I think these things that can, can benefit the player that has 1000 rating or somebody that is a GM himself. Uh, that, That's true. That was my goal, yeah. That's true. Very, very universal in the application of all those things, because actually one of the things that ties, you know, a top professional player and a 1000 rated player together, as you say, is that we share certain experiences. Like if a 1000 player hears, you know, um, hears Nepomniachi talk about his opening preparation, they're not really going to understand any of it. But if he talks about how he felt after losing a game, then immediately we, we have that connection. So that is that is something that we all tend to share as chess players are some of the psychological and emotional dimensions. Absolutely. And yeah. it's actually fun that it's like it's the same with all other sports, basically. So I know a lot of um, sportsmen that are doing other sports. I was in a sports school myself. I'm in an athlete's commission of uh, Swiss Olympic. Um, so I work with other sportsmen and it's it's the same. Like it's different, but it's the same. There are right. the same emotions. There is the same stress. There is the same. What do you do before a game? Nervosity during a game. You know you you messed up something. How how can you bring yourself in that state of mind to to get back again? Like thinking of a ski racer, for example, if he makes one mistake, well, he he is still going downhill with like a hundred. <laughs> uh, kilometers per hour so he doesn't have that much time to think about oh i screw up screwed up or whatever so yeah. i think you can take a lot of things also from other sportsmen nor can he really just like resign and like wait for the next tournament i mean <laughs> yeah exactly yeah i mean that's uh yeah and no, it's it's really fun to to see the moment you talk with them um about the emotional aspects or or whatever it's it's really i just felt well they all have the same problems it's uh it's very interesting Okay, and now let me ask you another goal, sort of like, you know, stepping behind behind the public stuff again and say, I want to ask you about the goals for your blog. And by that, I don't mean teaching people. Of course, that's a goal for your blog, right? But like our project, Chess Dojo, obviously, we have a goal of, of teaching people. But behind that, you know, Kostya, Jesse and I each have like purposes or ambitions for our project, right? As far as are we trying to become famous or are we trying to make money or are we trying to reach a certain number of people or wh whatever that might be? What goals do you have for this project? Um, any way of measuring its success beyond, um, you know, teaching people and getting positive comments? So um, to answer the question, I have to dial a bit back because I basically started the blog without too much expectations of goals or financial things or how many people I reach. But it was really about, I thought so much about it. And most of the people that I follow actually, um, be it Tim Ferriss, which I um, really admire. He is a, was a blogger himself, has a huge podcast now. Um, Derek Sivers, there are so many great thinkers that actually are writing a lot of the time. Uh -huh. So I have been thinking about that, but I was very afraid of writing also in English and, you know, how, how would that work out? Um, so it was a challenge to myself in the beginning to, to just go out there and do it. Like I've thought a lot about these things. So I thought, okay, now is the time. I've actually read four hour work week of Tim Ferriss. And at some point he just says, okay, now you have to do the first step tomorrow, the second, and after tomorrow, the third step. And that's basically how I started it and wrote my first blog. So first day was think about what do I actually, actually want to do? So I said, okay, I want a blog. Second day I set up the blog. Third day was the first post. And then suddenly it was out there. Uh -huh. So, so that's how it started. And, and I have been overwhelmed by, by, um, how many people have, have liked the blog. Like I'm, at 30 to 35,000 people per month now that right. are on the blog, which is 
insane if you ask which me. is shocking sometimes it feels like people aren't reading anymore and they want like you know they, they keep telling us to make the the youtube videos like eight minutes instead of 50 um and here you're writing something for people to actually sit down and read for several minutes <laughs> yeah it's it's really crazy because also some of my blog posts are like four thousand words or something so right it's like yeah, um, read it and then think about it. So yeah, it, it, I wasn't, I was really not expecting anything like that. But um, yeah, that's that's where we are. And now, um, I, I I want to do something out of it. That's uh, that's what I know. It's not anymore just the, uh, um, let's say the the challenge to myself was done. Like that's I know I can write now. That's at least not terri- terribly uh, bad. So. So that's that's something nice from it. And now yeah. um, I want to scale, reach more people. And, and then um, I'm in the process of thinking about what I could do to, um, you know, to reach more people or offer offer something uh, a bit more personal, not coaching, but maybe some courses. Uh, people have asked if I would do um, some courses or some Q&As or, you know, different different ideas for, for spreading the word even more. So that's where I'm at now. Okay. But, um, so you, a course would go beyond the format of the blog, actually. So that wouldn't just be reaching more people with the blog. That would be adding another dimension. Yeah. Yeah, that would be that would be having a video course. Um, I'm a bit reluctant um, to do that still because, um, you know, I've I've not been a great fan of most of video courses out there because I think it's not the greatest thing for amateurs. Like, I'm I'm always saying like don't do too many opening courses. Nearly every amateur I know is studying too much openings and sure. just the, the thing of just smashing variations into your brain it's just it, no it just doesn't work like that in my opinion yeah. um so but i'm thinking about ways that i could stand behind fully like um um trying to show let's say how i think a video course should be done and it would definitely be also much more about you know uh, psychology um setting up plans you know, whatever I'm also writing on the blog, um, just more specifically, more um, direct to people and um, just helping them on their way to to improve their chance. Yeah. Um, okay, super. So, um, and as for the as for the blog, do you have any plan to ever like monetize it in any way? Do Do you get anything out of doing the blog other than satisfaction and challenge at the moment i'm at zero Uh, so um i'm actually i don't want to put ads on my blog so i hope even if i would get the temptation one day i can you know revisit what i said today and then it keeps me from not doing it because i i just don't like to go to website where i'm spammed with some ads so i don't want to do it myself Okay. Um, so somebody can clip this and send it to you just to keep you. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> just uh, just put it in my face the moment I uh, I have ads on my blog. But um, no, I think what can be nice is um, I mean courses obviously would um, would not be um, free at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, the blog should be free in general. But um, via courses or maybe. Um, you know, affiliate projects with people that I really think do a great job on the internet or some um, some coaching stuff I really like, that, that can be a, a possibility. And mm-hmm. obviously at some point, if I keep putting that amount of energy inside, um, probably at some point I should, should also earn something out of it. Yeah. Well, if you just want an idea for reaching more people with your blog, the obvious idea to me would be for you to post it in German... Swiss, German, Italian, French, and Spanish. Yeah, but uh, might be confusing, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not only for myself, but <laughs> for everybody visiting. <laughs> yeah. You might but need yeah. a little like technical help for it, but you could have yeah. it so that people just get it in their, their like it sort of, yeah. it sort of ask them when they come, like, mm. what's your default mm-hmm. language? And then. You could just serve it to them like that, maybe. Yeah, that could be something. Yeah, that could be could be something to look into. Thank yeah. you. Okay, let's move to our topic for today: chess professionalism. And uh, let's first just get a definition out there. What makes someone a chess professional? Um, 
I mean, that's only my personal view on it. But I think uh, you're a professional if you earn your money um, as a chess player. So I see, if I say I'm a chess pro, I always think about the player side. So somebody that is coaching, in my opinion, is rather a chess coach and not a chess professional. Right. So, so their profession is coaching or teaching, if that's exactly. really. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, yeah, it's basically just making money by playing chess. Uh, yeah. I would say. And, and just to be clear, like I'm asking questions here, but in theory, if we have a topic where we ever disagree, I will you know, talk back and forth with Noel and, 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 and state my opinion as well. And if I just agree with him, I'll just ask another question. Like I'm just an interviewer, but I am here to argue if need be. And normally the dojo talks have some amount of arguing. Um, I remember early on in my own very short professional chess playing career, I was at a tournament and my opponent, a grandmaster, I was an IM, um, my opponent, a grandmaster, asked me in the postmortem, like, are you a chess professional? He just, he just asked it and I just said, yes, I am. So it, um, so I, I think a lot of it is like a personal like state of mind and like recognition that that is your goal and that's what you're doing. You can't look at somebody's title or rating or anything like that and determine if they're a professional based on that, right? It's are they earning their money, like Noel says, or... Perhaps it could be, do they intend to earn their money mm -hmm. by playing, right? Because there may be a period of time where you don't earn that much by playing chess. Yeah, certainly. I mean, let's say if you still have, you, you know, some something on the side or whatever, and you're just using that money trying to make it work, then I would say, yeah, you're a professional. But if you're still working a corporate job or studying or whatever, and yeah. you, it's like a side gig, I would say, yeah, you're an aspiring professional chess player, probably, yeah, and you're you want to get there, but you're not yet there. So sometimes I also refer to my first two years as like half professional, semi professional, whatever, because I was still living at home and my parents supported me in a way. So you can say, okay, guy, just yeah, it's not really earning his money because the parents still pay lessons or whatever. That's mm -hmm. um, that's not it. But since I really live on my own, I pay my own bills. Mm -hmm. um, that's basically the point where I was 100% like now I'm fully chess professional. Well, I think you started with great sponsors and you could have just gotten a nice shirt and put like mom and dad with a little <laughs> logo. <laughs> yeah, that would be also nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Show everybody that you already have a sponsor, you know how to attract sponsorship. And then we move on to the topic of how does one seek sponsorship? Well, it has been quite a struggle, I have to be honest. Um, I'm at a nice point now. Um, obviously, through the pandemic, I think it got more clear even that it was a very good choice, um, having somebody that supports you, uh, even if you can't play tournaments. So how did I go about it? I basically already learned a bit in school, you know, writing some, um, some seven, eight page um, document about myself, what I want to achieve, what I can give to, um, to sponsors. But um, I've sent that out um, back six, seven years ago, even when I was in high school, but just basically no response. So it's extremely hard if you don't know anybody or if you're not really in the media. Um, but I would say what, what you should always think about if you are searching for a sponsorship is what can I provide for them? What is what I first did was always I wrote, yeah, you can help me become a great player or you can help me, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's not working in general. Like a company doesn't I, I'm sorry to say it, but they don't care or at least they don't care that much um, if if you're getting great or whatever. They just want to know what are you bringing to us? Mm -hmm. So. Then I started working with a manager and he started also telling me these things and, and he brought me into a very big foundation in Switzerland, which was extremely nice, um, where I was alongside people that will now participate in the Olympic Games this, uh, this year and are really just amazing sportsmen. So that was like a push for myself. Okay, I can do it. Um, and how it worked with my main sponsor was simply, I was really thinking about what can they win from our partnership. So right. it is a computer manufacturer. So they don't do the, the computer, but they take different, um, 
how should I say, techni different technical parts and they right. put it together for you. So you yeah. can just go to, to a homepage and you can just click, I want this processor, I want this graphics card and they mm -hmm. do it for you. Okay, and so they assemble, they assemble components from a wide variety exactly. of manufacturers of chips and et cetera. Exactly, and, and basically the thing um, I was thinking about was like, I didn't know of them. They are Swiss, but I didn't know them. And there are so many chess players that need a computer Right. But nobody knows about them. So that was basically my mail. I was just writing them. Actually, back then for a tournament I organized. And I was writing him, well, you know, I would like a computer for the tournament. And what I can give you is that nobody in chess knows you. But through me, everybody will know you. And I explained to him why people need a computer. And it was like five hours later, I got a mail that, yeah, it's fixed, basically. And they nice. asked me if they could also sponsor myself. So it, it was just really ah. a situation where I understood how I, my presence can help them. And I think that's the most important thing if you um, were to try to search a sponsor. Mm -hmm. Right. Start from the question of what is a company out there that I could do something for or help in exactly. some way Who instead of writing to every single company. Also, yeah, I think quality also there is above quantity. You need some, sometimes you, it can work if you just send out a thousand letters or whatever. Right. But you have to understand that most of these companies, especially if they are big, they get hundreds of such letters nearly every day. Right. There are companies that only do it online anymore. And only to be seen, you have to do something special or you have to be extremely lucky or you have to know somebody. Yeah. Like just writing, hey, I would like a sponsoring. Would you be ready to talk about it? Like just forget about it. These guys have so much on their mind. You need to be clear in the first, let's say, five sentences that you can bring them something they want. And right. if that's the case, they will read the whole thing and then maybe they, they, can, they can start to talk to you. Yeah. Cool. So should we, should we name your sponsor here to give them a little benefit? That would be nice. Um, they are only uh, working around Switzerland, so um, that's pretty limiting, but um, okay. they are called Brentford PC. Okay. And wherever basically you see a uh, picture of me, I always have them on my suit or on my, um, I mean, whenever I play, I have them on my suit. Yeah. Great. Um, and how long have you had this sponsor? Like, um, is this a long-term arrangement you expect here we are in the third year of mm -hmm. uh, the partnership and um yeah i'm actually very very grateful that um even due to corona they were also hit hard um we, it basically finished um it was a two-year contract that finished end of 2020 and they were very happy to continue the work even though even like the situation wasn't that easy for them so right. that was also a big boost for, for me, you know, just somebody telling you, well, you've only played, I don't know, 35 games a year or whatever, which is just ridiculous for a chess professional, but we believe in you and we want to continue the work. I think that was, that was amazing. Great. Great. Well, I guess on their side that they're also very happy with you, just like that. Um, Let's move on to their next topic, which is going to in incorporate this question of, okay, you're getting, uh, you personally are getting income from a sponsor, but how in general should a chess pro structure their income? And uh, not a question for someone like Magnus Carlsen, who can make money from whatever he does, but let's say advice for somebody you know, who's somewhere between 2,400 and 2,700. So, um, you know, what are the different sources of income that are plausible for a chess player in that range? You could, you could list some of them off for us and then give us any advice on how to structure that. Mm -hmm. That's a very good one, actually. So um, I'm earning money from sponsors. I have this foundation that uh, supports me. Um, a lot and then I earn from playing leagues uh, but that's very very few um, I earn if I play tournaments and I actually gave some um, talks to businesses about um, 
um, strategic thinking or, or similar things. So that goes a bit into the media work that is also connected to the sponsoring, I would say. Mm -hmm. That's, let's say, the things I earned from. Um, for myself, it was always clear I didn't want to have to win a tournament to survive. Like I always said, if I want to do this chess professional thing, I need to find a way to not be under pressure when I play tournaments. I need to find a way to have enough money by other sources that I don't feel I need to play this tournament or I need to win this game because if not, I don't pay my bills. That mm -hmm. was a, a personal choice. Um, yeah. And I would encourage everybody to try to go the harder way because it is the harder way to try to search sponsors or think about what can I give to a, to a company or where can I have um, some stable relationship because I think nobody enjoys being at the tournament having to win money for, for paying his, his bills the next month. So um, mm -hmm. I think taking that pressure off you can really help you. It's interesting that. because... Our definition of being a chess professional, it would be kind of like fundamentally that playing is sort of like your fundamental activity. And so one thinks, you know, OK, that means you have to be at a level where you're winning prizes and this and that. But but your first no, no for your the structure of your career is don't have your livelihood depend on your result from tournament to tournament. Yeah, that, that that's I mean, at least for myself. I just put myself anyway under such a big pressure usually mm -hmm. that uh, even having that additional pressure of having to win finances, I think I would really just not enjoy it anymore at some point. Mm -hmm. Now, there's to be said, if you're, um, you know, if you have still some two, three years left and, and you have a choice to make, let's say, if you're sure or if you're confident that you're getting above 2,700 and you will get invited to these big tournaments, then I think it's a different thing because even if you lose now in this um, you know, Magnus chess tour or Meltwater chess tour, however it's called, mm -hmm. you, your last, you win $5,000. Like the pressure is kind of off, I would say. It's, that, that's totally fine, right? right? But unless you're coming in there, then I think it's smart to think about different ways to secure an income, to be then free in your mind, to be able to, to play the game um, also have some enjoyment, right? That's, mm -hmm. um, I think that's very important. So you've mentioned sponsorship. What are some other ways that uh, a chess player could earn money while basically being focused on playing? Well, I mean, what the most people do is coaching, right? Mm -hmm. um, where I always, you know, I, I was on and off with coaching as well. Um, but for myself, it was always, you know, unclear or I struggled to be completely focused on myself when I did coaching because I really tried to think a lot about my students. And when I did so, I thought less about myself and this somehow mixed up my, my results. So you can certainly do it, but just be aware that it takes mental energy, at least if you want to do it right. Like if you just want to give puzzles or whatever and you're just sitting there and okay, the hour's over, let's get over with it, that's not taking too much mental energy. But if you're thinking about what does my student want and, and which opening should I show him, does this opening really fit, um, then it takes some energy. So, so for me, it's really the way of if you are top in your country or in your area, mm -hmm. I think sponsorship is the number one thing I would try to do. Or mm -hmm. in Switzerland, there are a lot of foundations that support young sportsmen. Um, so that's that's one thing or the one thing that was logical for me. And then you can really also think about, like, chess players have something very specific. We can plan, um, you know, this. it has something to it when you say you're a chess, you know, international master or grandmaster to mm -hmm. a company, and maybe they are ready to to listen to a talk of yours when you try to take the learnings you have in chess and put it in a business sense. And those talks can really pay well. And you have an upfront work, like you have to do these talks. You really have to have a great talk, not just a good one. Um, but once you have a talk that is great, then you can also 
it doesn't matter too much if it's company A or B, you just put it in their field. Like if it's an insurance company, you think shortly, again, what do they want? What do they need? If it's a bank, it's something different. Again, then you, you put it on what a bank needs, right? Mm -hmm. Once you have that clear idea of what you want to show them, tell them, that could be also a way. So I imagine that in a sense, those are like one-time gigs. And so there's a certain effort to find to find it, like a certain amount of time to find it. It's not like it's not like you're receiving inquiries and you have to decide which talks you want to give. It's almost something like you have to go out and offer. Is that true? Yeah, it, it depends. It all hangs together with what media attention you get. Um, mm. Let me be honest at this point. If you're number 30 of your country and you're not that young anymore, it's very hard that people will care about you. Like mm -hmm. with me, it was a lot, you know, I'm the youngest um, ever Swiss just grandmaster. So that took a lot of, you know, media attention. Then I was one of the youngest Swiss champions when I was only 19. I won the Swiss championship with many grandmasters. So I, I don't want to make you lose time because I tell you something and then everybody says, but I don't get sponsors. Right. If you're not close to top in your country or region, if it's a huge country, I right. think it will be hard. Right. But if you are, or you are still young and there is something you're number one or two in your age group in your country, then I think this can this can really be a question. And yes, people will normally not just write you mails, but um, you you are getting contacts once you get that first talk, or once you are in the media, you maybe know somebody that knows somebody that knows that you have a great talk. And then you get your first gig and then they are all connected. So the guy that is then eating his lunch with other CEOs will tell, yeah, but the other day there was this, this guy, Studer, he was talking to us about whatever. And then another guy says, ah, really? And then he, he picks it up. But obviously I also had connection through my manager. That was, that was also very helpful. Yeah. All right. Let me ask you one or two other sources of income we haven't mentioned. How about uh, streaming on Twitch? I think that can be fun. That can be um, can be a good way. Again, at least seeing from my girlfriend experience, um, who is a streamer herself, um, I think it's also not that easy to like expect it in the first month that you get some some finances back. So it can take quite a while um, yeah. to get it running. I think it's the same with the blog. It's the same with the sponsoring. These are all like approaches. You shouldn't take this approach if you just want to try it two months and then you need a stable income. Like it's it's basically not going to work. Right. Uh, um, but then again, you have to ask yourself, do I really, if I just have two months and then I need the stable income, do I really want to do it? Like, I think that's, for me, it was, as I said, it was always clear. I don't want to do it. I don't want to go on tournaments having to win something. If you're saying that's my dream, then maybe go for it. But I can't imagine for myself that I would like it. Yeah. So yeah. Um, how about writing uh, or producing content for somebody else, be it like a chess website or a book publisher, Chessable, chess.com, quality chess? Um, is that a viable way for a chess professional to get some stable in income outside of playing, but still try to you know, have a strong playing career? Um, certainly also viable options, yeah. Um, I think you always have to ask yourself that the best thing you want to do, or what I try to do is to have an upfront investment in time, but at some point, getting to a point where you don't have to invest West that, that much energy anymore. So I, I searched sponsors, but at some point I signed these deals. It's a one or two year deal. And that's it, you know, I know I have that money. And with the foundation, it was even a three-year deal, basically. Mm -hmm. So I knew I have three years where they give me a very substantial amount um, that I could pay basically all my coaching costs already and, and some other costs. So that, that for me made it very easy to then go back on focusing on myself. So, for example, writing a book, again, you have a big upfront investment, but once it's out... Probably you will get money every month if you write a good book. Um, so that can be an idea. So if you're really thinking about doing it professionally, I think it's 
about something where you put a lot of effort in, in the beginning, mostly for zero money. And then you hope to have something out there that can produce you some kind of stable income, as you say, without having to care too much about it. Mm -hmm. That's, okay. I think. That's, so that you can uh, recapture that focus from your last blog post. Exactly. For your exactly. That's, it's like setting up to have a focus. Um, obviously, again, there are some people that can't just put everything in chess and they'll reach 2750 and then it's easier because you have these things basically automatically. Mm -hmm. I also have to say this, sponsoring gets easier the stronger you get. Like, yeah. <laughs> obviously, Surprise. Yeah, if I would have 2750, I wouldn't have to knock on the doors of people. Right. Like I just, especially in Switzerland, I just get sponsoring offers probably every day. So that it's always weighing your options, but coming from 2430 when I started, I wasn't too sure that I'll just reach 2700 in like I don't know, two or three years. Right. But, so that, um, that's why I, I took this one. Okay. Cool. Moving on and somewhat related to this, what activities should a chess pro engage in beyond playing? Okay. We've talked about what money they get out of them. Um, maybe we'll try and be quick on this topic, but uh, any activities that you would particularly recommend or tell somebody to stay away from if they want to be a professional player? Um, okay. Let's, let's try to be quick here. Um, sport. Very important physical sport, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I am extremely into meditation. I think it just calms your brain and you're just so much more focused um, when it counts. I struggle to keep the routine, but I know that it helps me a lot. What helps me as well is writing diary. Again, getting thoughts out of your mind. Um, basically, everything I say is helping me to... Um, to focus, again, to find that focus during a game or during the training so I don't have like 7,000 things in my mind when I sit at the chessboard. Mm -hmm. um, and then try to find something that, that is just, you know, bringing you pleasure uh, when you're, when you're off, off training or off tournament. I think that's, uh, that can be a sport, but that can be, um, I don't know, drawing. It can be going fishing, which is pretty common in Switzerland, for example, searching mushrooms, which is pretty common in Switzerland. There are so many things that you can do, actually. I, mm -hmm. I like just to go for walks. Actually, before our interview, I was just walking for an hour to the nice. forest and without any phone. And this is just um, extremely pure activity for me. But I think completely different for everybody. But that would yeah. be four things. I actually have one big don't if somebody wants to be a professional chess player. Mine would be do not teach chess lessons to players that are more than like, you know, two or three hundred points below you. Um, I, I think it can be OK to, to provide some training to players who are somewhat close to your level. Like if you're twenty five hundred, you could teach some lessons to, to some talented twenty three hundreds who are working towards their titles. But I think that if you're. If you're, you know, a grandmaster working on improving your game, you can't be f spending too much time. You can't really be spending your, your mind on the problems of a 1000 or a 1400. And that includes writing a book or making a video or teaching a private lesson. That's all that's all teaching. That's that would be my big don't. That's a great point, actually. Yeah. Because you have to put your mind always like down a level, right? If you yeah. teach them, you're, you're just thinking what would they think. And in some way, this influences your, your own chest. Yeah. And then right along with that is like playing games. Like I think that there could be a good way to stream um, and be a professional chess player. But to spend a lot of time playing games with lower rated players, I think also like just like teaching lower rated players, I think it'll tend to give you bad um, chess habits because now you're spending time with chess pieces but thinking completely differently than, what, than the way you actually need to think in your main job so I, I think you're actually giving yourself bad habits to like maybe be relaxed when you're around chess pieces or maybe assume that any move you play is going to be good enough or mm -hmm. I, I think you really can create some very bad habits that will then be like associated with chess pieces because when you see chess pieces certain parts of you just 
you know, turn on or off, right? And I think you want to be very careful about which those are. That's a great point, yeah. And I think um, this makes it also clear that you should play always tournaments with higher rated players. Like, try to find tournaments where you actually have these very strong players you have to face and not easy wins or whatever, because you can just learn so much more out of games against really, really strong opponents. Mm -hmm. All right. And now we come to our uh, last broad topic. There are going to be a few subtopics below it, and that is what assistance should a chess pro hire? Um, And I'll click right ahead to the first option. A manager. What would be the value of hiring a manager as a chess pro? Um, so I have, I had one. Um, I'm not working with him anymore, but it just took a lot of work off my shoulders when um, thinking about management, when thinking about sponsoring, when thinking about media. So I'm really very grateful to to the job he did for me. Um, and. I think, yeah, it can help you if you are searching on that path to sponsorship and with media. It can help you a lot because usually you just pay a percentage of the sponsoring deals. So you don't really have a downside. And some people um, then say, well, but I don't want to give this 20% away. But well, but think you will spend these hours instead of talking to some sponsors or media or whatever, that maybe one out of 10 is a successful sponsorship, you will just work work on your chess. And that will make you so much more interesting. And then you will take this 20% like tenfold back. So I think in that case, it can be very, very, very good. Okay. I would, yeah, I mean, the math you suggest looks really like obvious, like, like no brainer that it's good to have somebody else do a job that they're specialized at, that you're not specialized at, and the cost is a percentage. So... I mean, I can just see like right away, you can only gain money from it compared to doing that, trying to do that work yourself. Um, And I would guess the biggest issue here is just, are you interesting enough that a manager actually wants to work with you? Like they have to see the potential to earn enough that their percentage will be enough. Yeah, certainly. I was super lucky because I had a friend that had an uncle that was sports manager. So he actually contacted me because he asked his friend, is there somebody playing chess that would be a good fit? Um, But if not, I would even consider, if you're not that interesting, try to up the percentage. So Mm -hmm. let's say there is, I won't say what I had to pay, but I would say between 20 and 40% would be the percentage what gets the manager. Right. And be ready to even pay 40, maybe even 50% in the beginning. And right. be straight, just say to him, I want to show you that I'm worth it. And you can take 50%, maybe you can even take 60%, whatever. But right. if we do these deals, like you set an amount of money or whatever, yeah, then we come ba- down. So with every deal, let's say you take 10% less un- until we are in 20%. So right. that could be a way of him thinking, okay, that, that could still pay off even if I have a lot of work. But if then I take 60% from it, that's fine. And then we slowly go down when he has the proof that, that it's working. So that right. would be one thought of trying to make yourself more attractive. Right. That makes sense. Because like in theory, you know, Magnus Carlsen could offer you like, well, find me sponsors and I'll give you like 2%. And you would say like, oh, that's still going to be quite a bit of money. And if I asked somebody to, you know, find me sponsors, I would have to offer them much more for them to think that they were going to get some income. So if you're on the borderline of being good enough for it, increasing the percentage you offer initially um, could get you started. Great idea. I haven't disagreed with anything yet, have I? (laughs) (laughs) No, um, we will find still a point. We will just go on until we find a point. (laughs) Maybe, maybe. I spent a while reading your blog and I, I... you know, initially before we picked our topic, spent some time reading your blog, looking for something I could disagree with, but it's tough. Um, next topic, what is the value of hiring a sports psychologist? This is one of my, ma- my favorite topics because um, 
I think he has just done so much um, for me, my sports psychologist. Um, it's it's not only that you just play better. So how I see it is that you can train chess. There is one part is um, playing better, knowing better chess, let's say, and mm-hmm. the other part is playing better chess. So one is like your theoret- theoretical knowledge, and the other part is then how much do you bring to the board? So let's say I could now bring between 2650 and 2500 to the board. So, and this range is basically what decides now, if I work with a sports psychologist, if I can bring 25 or 2650. Um, right. and, and he just helps me reach my full potential. He helps me talk through different difficult situations. He helps me, um, you know, it's just somebody that thinks clear when I'm maybe not, when I have some, some, you know, personal issues with persons and I'm about to do something stupid that I wouldn't, uh, would then later regret or, um, you know, just losing a game. And I could even call him via Skype and say, I mean, my mind is just completely off. What should I do? Um, yeah, he just gives me great advice. He has a lot of routines, even though he doesn't play chess at all. Like he understands it. And I can tell you after one hour visit at my sports psychologist, I think he was the person that knew me best in my whole life. And it's pro it's just insane. Like what he takes out from like my, it was one hour where I just talked about my whole life basically. Yeah. And what he told me after that hour, and I will always remember, he told me, well, you should go in a single room and not a double room in a tournament. That was basically one takeaway. And I was like looking at him, what the heck are you talking about? Mm -hmm. I have never been anymore in a double room. And it was the best decision. I'm just not the type to be with somebody else having different sleep cycles and so on. I need my habits. I need my clear clear stuff. And that's just one example. And just after one hour, he just knows you that well. And and he has become a friend and... Also in, in you know, non-sports uh, situations, he's just a great help. So, All right. Go search one. So, um. yeah. <laughs> so anybody out there who's a grandmaster who's never worked with a sports psychologist, that's absolute. like a 100% absolute recommendation. Yeah. For me, I mean, maybe you have to find the right one because it needs mm-hmm. to really be somebody that you trust. If you're not... If you're only 95% honest, it won't work. So it's mm-hmm. also about how you do it. If you go there and you think, well, nah, he will anyway not bring me anything, you won't get anything out of it. Sure. You need to be fully honest, lay all the cards on, on the table, and then it can really, yeah, it can really change so much. Cool. All right, next up, a coach. So here I mean a chess coach. What's the value of hiring a chess coach? Again, definitive yes. I mean, as you might understand, probably to everything you ask, I'll just say yes. I mean, mm-hmm. I have my team is quite big, so <laughs> so um, yeah. Um, he helps in a lot of ways. Uh, one way that is extremely valuable for me is preparation on a tournament. Mm-hmm. Um, so he might work nights when uh, I just wake up and I have a file on my computer. I just have to click through. So that's uh, just one thing that is extremely valuable. Um, I work with Marcus Rugger, if, uh, if anybody is interested. So he is still mm-hmm. playing a bit himself, but mainly coaching. Okay. Um, actually, at the moment, it's like first time in, I don't know, two years where he is playing a tournament and I'm not, okay. which is pretty funny. But um, <laughs> yeah, so he just, he helped me so much with openings, but he helps me also. For example, if you think about um, studying tactics, so you can just go about and you just take all these books and you go through them, right? And let's say maybe a third of the book is great for you and the other two thirds are, yeah, it's okay, you did it, but it's not really awesome. Yeah. And what a coach can do is simply know you, take the third out of each book and just collect that together. And then, for example, he gives me some tactic tests that just takes some position from different books and he says, that will suit you. And he mm-hmm. won't say me like it's made in five or it's whatever. Right? I just don't know what it is about. I don't know out of which book. And it's like a normal position in a game. And I just have to think about it. So I would say you can 
again, win a lot of time actually by investing in a coach that really cares about you because he can take away the things that don't matter too much for your chess improvement and give you only the things that are great. Uh, that's how I would. Yeah. Good. I've never, I've almost never worked with, you know, some of these things that you've worked with. I've never had a manager, even though I was trying to be professional. I've never had, um, you know, the only chess coach I had really was when I was a kid. But once I was actually like a master um, trying to get better, I didn't have a chess coach at that point. Never a sports psychologist. I mean, for me, a lot of it was just I mean, I think one piece of it was would have been affording it. But one piece is even thinking of it. I think even people who consider themselves chess professionals don't necessarily have as professional an approach as you. It's like you have some talent, you have some interest, you put in some hard work even, and yet there's an element to it that's sort of amateurish where you don't have a team and like a system, you just kind of throw yourself at chess and and hope to break through. Yeah, absolutely. And that probably has also to do with that I'm probably much less talented than most of these guys, so I had to find other ways, right? Mm -hmm. If you just automatically progress and with 17 you're like 2700 yeah. then automatically you get the money you have the invitation you're not really thinking about these things right right why should i need sponsorship if i anyway have enough money i i can get it that you just don't care about these things anymore and getting so good very fast can also show you like why do i need somebody that tells me mm -hmm. like but for me I, in these respects i have always seen magnus as a as an example because mm -hmm. he, he had, or I think he still works with a manager. Yeah. And he, he still has his team. Like, yeah. he has Peter Heine Nielsen that takes a lot of care. And, and thinking of these, like, for example, for myself, it's also like Roger Federer still has a coaching team. Like, if he still thinks he needs coaches, like, who am I to not work <laughs> with a coach anymore? Yeah. Like, am I really that ridiculous to think I don't need a coach anymore? If Roger Federer is still investing in coaches, right? Like right. the guy, you could think he has figured everything out, but there is something that he thinks he still gets from coaches. Same with, I don't know, Cristiano Ronaldo, Messi, everybody. They, if you see Barcelona play, if they have a bad coach, they play bad. If they have a very good coach, they suddenly play very good. What changed? The coach. So I think the coach is still very, very important. Yeah. And it's true that also, like if we compare chess to other sports, I mean... There's no, I mean, all the professional sports organizations, when it's more than just a player, when it's a team sport and there's an organization, they all have managers and psychologists and coaches. Like there, there isn't a team that doesn't have these kind of positions. Um, so actually we could say that compared to other sports, chess players have kind of an amateurish approach to chess professionalism. Absolutely. I would sign that. Uh, any day hmm. um the value of hiring a physical trainer for a chess player um i think it's less high than the others but it's mm -hmm. something that can help you um i had a friend doing it for me um for some time just writing me some plans what i should go to do um and you know, it's, it's just nice having a plan and knowing what you should do and not thinking about other things again it's if I know somebody that knows something better than me and I can afford it, I usually go for it. So I'm, I'm trying to hire as many people as possible if I know they are specialists and I'm good at chess so I can just focus on training chess and playing chess and, and somebody else can focus on sending me a training plan, I'll just do it. Um, yeah. But I don't have that anymore. Um, somebody that gives me workouts or whatever. But I have, uh, um, I don't know how you say it in English, but physiotherapist, is that a, a thing mm -hmm. that you can say? Yeah. Yeah. So somebody that, you know, with massage and so on, yeah. um, works uh, on my body a bit more. So that's, that's something I have. But I think out of all the things we discussed yet, that's the lowest um, yeah. need for a chess professional. You can also just, you know, find your online training routine for, I don't know. You buy right. a course for like 50 bucks and then you do it all year and that's fine. Yeah. So your physical strength and, and, and fitness 
is important, but you don't need to be a professional at that. So you don't need this. You don't need to reach the same level of personalization and optimization there. You could Absolutely. come up with like a general plan that other people use. You could watch YouTube videos. You could have like one lesson where someone gives you a plan and then you could follow it for a while. Exactly. For yeah. example, I have a very simple approach now. I'll just do twice endurance per week, mm -hmm. half an hour to an hour. That could be running or being on my home trainer. Then I have twice yoga to get stretching to do all these things. And I have twice strength training where I just have an app where I have I follow just the strength thing. So that's yeah. it's as easy. As, uh, and Sunday is free. And that's it. And you can come up with such a thing in an hour and then just it's about doing it and not about you know, figuring out the greatest way, as you said. That's great. And one last idea, and this would not involve hiring, but what's the value of having a teammate? And I'll just define this really quickly before Noel gives us a correct answer to this question. Um, a teammate is somebody who you sort of like work with, you exchange ideas, you could play training games, you could trade chess analysis, you could prepare together for events either that both of you are playing or like you alternate like one tournament, player A prepares player B, next tournament player B prepares player A. Um, something that most sports organizations, again, would have just because they would be team sports. Chess does not necessarily have to be a team sport, but you could still have a teammate. Um, Noel, what's, what's the value here? So here I'm no expert at all because somehow I've never managed to have a really stable, let's say, teammate relationship with anybody. So mm -hmm. in Switzerland, um, most players are not as motivated as me. So that was a thing. And then yeah. internationally, probably I also didn't try enough or maybe I'm also just too complex as a person. I don't know. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask you back because you okay. told me that you've lived with Chessy, right? Yeah. So maybe you had that kind of situation, right? Yeah, for me, actually, it's been the most valuable thing that I've had. But that said, we know that I haven't had any of the other things that you mentioned, so I can't necessarily compare the value. But the value for me has been really great. You know, instead of like, having a coach tell me stuff to do. I've had training partners. I've lived in like a chess house with like five chess players. Um, and uh, that's really what what's helped me along the most in my career. Almost the only exception to me being a complete amateur trying to figure everything out by myself just by throwing myself against things, you know, is to have that back and forth with other players. Um, and... I, I think it's been a tremendous value. I mean, right now I'm all excited thinking of all the potential of everything you mentioned. If I, if I knew about that stuff, you know, 15 years ago, I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm like wondering in my head, like how many ELO points would it have been to have been an actual professional, <laughs> you know? Um, I, you know, because one thing I do is like I can profile chess players. I can play through their games in the database and figure out a lot of things about them. I mean, I know like what their ambitions were, when they when they were excited about chess, when they seemed a little less excited for a while, when they had like a crisis, you know, whether or not they recovered, where, where their ambitions went. You know, almost everybody at some point thought that they could become world champion. And you can find the moment in their career where they stopped believing um, and I've done that for lots of other players and I didn't do it for myself, uh, in that same detail. And like many, many years later, at some point, like I, I, I did a pro, I did a full profile on myself cause I'd like analyze strengths and weaknesses from like a chess perspective before events or what openings are other people going to try to get against me based on what's in the database now. But I did the full profile on myself and I was like, Oh, there's the moment I broke, you know? And it was like obvious. And if I'd had a psychologist or a coach or somebody with me, you know, maybe they would have told me that day and I could have, you know, unbroken or, or done something about it. So that's a great I, point. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really tantalized by everything you have. I mean, I no longer am a chess professional, but the thought of being a chess professional with a team is, I have to say, <laughs> it's hard not to run out and hire everybody you've mentioned. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's definitely a for affordability also, the, the question. And I think, yeah. again, it all hangs together with the approach of trying to get that stable 
money from foundations and sponsors and, and so on. So I can actually hire these people. Like I think yeah. if you need to win tournaments to get money, it's extremely hard to have the mindset of, yeah, let's hire this person. And if I don't win, then I can't pay my bills next month. So right. it's all a bit connected together. But actually what I was thinking is that having a great chess partner, accountability partner, teammate, whatever, I think that could have helped me or, or would still help me a lot. Like yeah. that's something I've always missed in, in a country like Switzerland. So when I look, you know, to St. Louis or wherever there are these, you know, these, these hotspots of chess players, I think that can be so, so cool. Like, yeah. So we've learned a lot from you today and maybe you've picked up one thing as somebody who's tried everything, hired everybody, believes in teams. Um, maybe that's one more thing that that you can go out and try. Find somebody in the wide world now that we're all connected online um, who matches you as a personality, who you could play training games with, trade opening ideas with. Maybe that's the last piece. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. In any case, we really appreciate having you here, Noel. I think you've elucidated a lot of really interesting questions and ideas for us that we otherwise don't talk about or think about. Um, I mean, it's crazy to think that I was a chess professional for like three years or so without ever thinking of, you know, a coach or a manager or a psychologist or physical training. Um, so uh, to any future chess professionals in the chat or who listen to this on in podcast form later, um, they will have a lot to thank you for. And I have to highly, highly recommend to everybody Noel's blog. I'm not recommending it because he's on here. He's on here because I recommend it. Um, and, um, you know, I've been seeing what he says on Twitter and nodding in agreement for several months. And uh, I think that you will all benefit very much from following this. Um, and that's going to bring our show to an end. So thank you so much, Noel. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me and for the nice words. And um, if you guys need some help, I'll answer every mail. So you can go to my blog and just write me a mail. Uh, until I can physically do it, I'll try to answer any mail. So, all so right. that's how you can reach me best. And then finally, the most important thing of all, you're a chess professional. We wish you success in passing Mr. Milov. We wish you success in getting a medal at the European Championships and one day winning your almost hometown tournament of Beal, which is where I first saw you play. Um, ah, yeah. yeah, great. I've Thank actually you so played, much. I've actually played the Beal tournament a couple times myself, and um, I saw you going up against some some big guns there, so... First time wasn't too successful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you were still an IM rated in the 2400s. Um, yep. Playing super and strong I lost players. Seven in a row, six in a row, six. Yeah. In a row. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't amazing. Good work. I've learned out of it. <laughs> One day you'll win six in a row there. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> All right. Um, so thank you very much. We'll talk to you later, I hope. And um, everybody else, we are now going to switch gears and go to our tournament here. So enjoy your tournament. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bye.